Okay, ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to the next Chi Web Pitches in 2021 within the framework of the Chi online community. My name is Paul. I will try to guide you through this Web Pitch session. And before we start, and I'm actually hand over to the experts from research and industry, which are here with us today. Let me have some words about the Qi online community, about the Qi web pitches, what is the intention behind that? Because we are here after a two months break. And before we start, let me have a short introduction. So qionline.com is established by the industry and for the industry. And this whole platform is organized by Perception Park, the SpectroNet cluster, the SFG, and the Enterprise Europe Network. And our intention with gonline.com is to provide a platform and building a knowledge hub, especially for spectral imaging in industry. And of course, we will see it in the applications far beyond. So why you should join the G community here, we set up a platform to meet friends, to learn from experts. You have every one of the spectral imaging community in one place. You can talk to partners and customers. You can experience technology in action. You get a good overlook about markets and trends. And of course, you will see spectral imaging in applications beyond the industry. So the intention of this web pitch format as part of the G online community platform, we want to inform about technologies and applications in spectral imaging. And our goal is to enable for everyone in the spectral imaging community to stay in contact with leading experts, partners, customers from research and the industry. So why G web pitches every month from now you will get insights on technologies and applications, experience what is happening in the spectral imaging market. And within this Qi web pitch format, you have the chance to learn about possibilities and benefits spectral imaging is providing for your business, for your applications in a short way. Therefore, we have today web pitch presentations and of course, a question and answer world where you can ask all the questions to the, to, the, to the speakers you want by using the question and answer functionality of the, of the conference system. So Qi web pitches from now on, every middle of the month on Wednesday, 3 p.m. to half past four Central European time, free topics, free speakers, and you have the chance to ask questions. And why we are doing this as SpectroNet cluster, our goal or our aim is to provide information about trends and developments. We want to facilitate communication with experts and institutions. And last but not least, support the collaborations with partners and customers. And that is why we are here. And that is why we are supporting such initiatives like the Chief Online Community. And today we have three speakers with three topics. And our first speaker will be Andrea Karasch from LLA Instruments, located in Berlin, Germany. And Ms. Karasch will speak about spectral imaging in the food processing industry and um, what devices, systems, LLA instruments is developing and applying successfully in industrial environments. So, Ms. Karash, the screen is yours, and it would be a pleasure if you can share your screen and provide us with your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Dietrich. One moment. And uh, thank you to the Qi Online um, team for having us. And of course, welcome everyone to this short presentation on spectral imaging in food processing industry. My name is Andrea Karasch, and I work 
for LLA Instruments since 2012 as application engineer and product manager for hyperspectral imaging cameras. So before I start with the real topic, maybe I should introduce to you uh, LLA Instruments. Um, LLA Instruments was founded in 1993 in Berlin, Germany, as a spin-off of the German Academy of Sciences. It was the research institute of the GDR. Um, now we are 30 employees, and we focus on high-speed technology for real-time analysis and sorting in industrial environments. We develop and manufacture near and UV-vis spectrometers and hyperspectral imaging cameras. Um, our systems are used in harsh industrial environments, and we are a trusted OEM partner in the recycling industry and in the food and mining industry. Um, we started even before 1999 to develop the first optical OEM components um, regarding NER spectrometers for industrial sorting applications. And up to now, we have sold more than 700 units worldwide, which are used and still used today in optical sorters. In 2011, we introduced the LLA hyperspectral imaging camera also as an opt OEM component for, <coughs> sorry, for industrial sorting uh, machines. And up to now, we have more than 500 installations in optical sorters worldwide. Um, we do have an in-house research and development team, uh, design and engineering, and also the manufacturing team. Um, the optics, the electronics, and the me mechanics are designed uh, on, are based on our designs. And of course, we also have an applications and software team. Now back to the topic. Um, Probably, if you are familiar with the classic NIR spectroscopy approach, uh, there are some advantages of spectral imaging cameras, especially if it comes to industrial applications. You have a fast and real-time result. Uh, the measurement only takes a fraction of seconds or a few milliseconds. And this enables online processes with up to 800 hertz measurement speeds. It is cost efficient for the plant manager because he can achieve a high throughput and this is a time saving. There is no or very easy sample preparation. You have a non-contact and non-destructive measurement. And you can, of course, monitor the full material stream, which is the prerequisite for optical sorting applications. You do have a low maintenance effort, and this makes it suitable for 24-7 applications. Now for the um, imaging industry, this is now not the news, but what is new for them is that you will have uh, the opportunity to monitor or use it in sorting the chemical composition if you use an NAR type of spectral imaging camera. And if you use a VIS or SWEAR type of spectral imaging camera, you can monitor the information of the dye color itself. Yeah. LLA Instruments uh, provides push boom type of hyperspectral imaging cameras. There are several types available on the market generally. Um, if you now need to select your setup, if you plan to use hyperspectral imaging cameras within your food application, either in sorting or in monitoring in a plant supervision, um, you will at first need to define the ideal spectral range for your application. Um, if you do not have a spectroscopic expertise, you can usually send small sample tests free of charge to the camera providers all over the world. They have small test centers and then they make a proposition of a spectral model based on the measurement results. In our case, the hyperspectral camera is uh, including spectrograph and electronic uh, camera in a IP protected housing. Uh, this is a prerequisite for industrial sorting applications. We have different models available in the NIR range for food sorting, 
uh, and food applications most important is the Unispec 1.7 model. And uh, for specialties, it's a 1.9 model available. And of course, we also have a VIS model with Unispec 0.9 HSI. The numbers always um, account for the cutoff wavelength. Yeah. Um, next, what you need to do is after you've defined your ideal spectral range for your application to define the required spectral and spatial resolution. Yeah. And in combination with the spatial resolution, you need to define what is the total field of view, meaning what is the material uh, sorting width I need. And this is in, in combination with the material throughput. Yeah. If you have uh, in mind to do a complicated quantitative analysis of uh, nutrients in the process, you should also rely on distortion-free spectrographs because these kind of applications require a high spectral resolution and um, a low uh, distortion of the spectrograph. Yeah. And if you need to know and uh, need to um, uh, look up spec sheets, um, these parameters for spectral and spatial distortions are called keystone and smile. Yeah. So in, IED, in an ideal world, these parameters should be as low as possible or ideally in zero. Yeah. And if you have defined your total field of view, yeah, uh, or the sorting width, for example, um, then you should also need to find the suitable uh, fixed focal length lens. Yeah. In industrial applications, it is generally advised not to use zoom lenses. And uh, in the near sorting, the zoom lenses are, as I do know, uh, not available. No. And at this last point regarding the camera hardware, you will need to define the environmental conditions, meaning something like an ingress, ingress protection level, uh, the operating temperature range where the camera should be operating, as well as the relative humidity and some, uh, some other things like uh, how do I connect the cameras to, uh, to the overall plant communication. Yeah, do I need Ethernet connectivity because this enables uh, long connection uh, uh, distance? No. Oh, sorry. Um, for another uh, important point is you, that you will need uh, additional supplies like a power supply. And you should think if uh, you get it all from one hand from, from your supplier and, and or if you have to make research on your own. Um, the same goes with an industrial PC and uh, if you have connection cables available. Um, and regarding the industrial PC, the next thing what you need to uh, talk about is not only the hardware, but also the control software, and most important, the brain of the camera, meaning the calibration model. Yeah, this defines your actual sorting task. Um, you can go more or less the classic approach using uh, classic chemometrical calibration model development software suite. Um, and uh, in case of uh, uh, hyperspectral imaging data, you will need both a spectral evaluation tool as well as a visualization tool for the hy hyperspectral imaging data to be able to uh, select objects uh, to check the object related uh, calibration models and so on. If you are more familiar with machine vision world, then uh, and you have your own algorithms and your own software suite, then uh, you should. Um, check if there is a uniform um, uh, data transfer possible, like, uh, for example, using a Genichem uh, interface. Um, yeah, you not only need a camera, unfortunately, you probably also need a suitable uh, diffuse reflective radiation source. 
yeah? because you cannot rely on the environmental uh, natural light uh, situation. There you will also need to check if there's a suitable model for your selected field of view. And you need to uh, make sure that you have the suitable vertical clearance option, meaning that you have enough free space between the optical unit itself and the material on the belt or in the free fall setup. Uh, in addition, you will need to uh, decide on whether to use a halogen or a LED based radiation source. Uh, there are now uh, some LED solutions available on the market, but they are still very high priced or not available and suitable for all applications, especially in the NIR range. Uh, and of course, the ingress protection level should be compatible with it of the camera. And uh, the last point, you will need a calibration target uh, for regular uh, intensity normalization of the uh, spectral signal. Uh, the last thing what you will need is a camera mounting system if you do not want to do it on your own. Um, meaning you will need a mounting bridge, including alignment options in all three dimensions, uh, which is suitable for your field of view. And uh, the last point is uh, you will need a vibration cushioned installation, not so much for the camera itself, but if you use a halogen uh, or LED based radiation source uh, to save uh, um, on the lifetime of the radiation, radiation sources. Um, if you need to implement the system into a plant, into an overall plant control or PLC, uh, you will need to think about communication options, um, uh, either to send the classification result for monitoring, um, for example, via EDP, uh, Ethernet, and uh, to, is it possible to have remote control options for the camera system itself? And uh, some, uh, especially in the monitoring business, prefer to use an adaption to Profinet, which is a uh, standard now. And in the sorting um, applications, you will also need uh, to decide if you plan to do the ejection via the plant control system or within the optical unit um, by sending the data, uh, the classification result data, including an ejection decision uh, to an ejection module. There are ejection modules available for, for example, for Festo systems or for, uh, based on Vago. Um, the food sorting applications um, can be uh, defined in, in uh, larger, big se uh, bigger segments. Uh, one is the analysis of uh, nutrient com content uh, within the products or fresh food, uh, such as fatty acids, carbohydrates, proteins, and as well as the moisture content can be determined. You can de do uh, foreign body detection, uh, foreign body meaning everything that is not wanted in your uh, food material stream, uh, such as plastics, wood, paper, insects, uh, other crops, unwanted crops, or plant parts. And uh, in the meat industry, it's mostly bone, but also blood uh, coagulates. Yeah. And in fresh products, for example, you can uh, monitor fruits, vegetables, fish, meat, and poultry, nuts, and seeds. Uh, and uh, the last point is a process control of uh, manufacturing processes, uh, granulation, pulverization, and coating processes. But this is also uh, possible uh, using uh, classical NIR spectrometers in, uh, in the plant. Um, now, at last, I want to show you uh, three images for, for different types of applications. One is um, uh, a test for mixed up components. Yeah. Uh, if you think on, on the topic food fraud, it's also uh, easy to uh, 
to exchange uh, components. In this case, it's uh, I will show it on the next example on candy. Yeah? So uh, this image shows uh, wonderful uniform candy. Yeah? And with NIR, you can uh, not only uh, detect the chemical composition, but you can also uh, differentiate between different types of uh, sugars or uh, carbohydrates. Uh, this is a spectrum showing uh, different kinds of uh, carbohydrates, and you can easily distinguish between uh, the different types according to their absorption band uh, features. If you use uh, this kind of spectral information in the chemometrical approach and uh, define a classification model, you will have a result uh, which looks as a false color classification result um, corresponding uh, to uh, um, a green color, which is uh, uh, corresponding to an artificial sweetener. And the red color uh, candy types are correspond to classical candy uh, containing sucrose. Yeah. Um, another uh, example is the content verification in mixtures. Uh, this is more um, at line test uh, for, uh, for packed bags. For example, here a cereal bag or a mixed cereal bag. In the center, you can see the grayscale on edge of mixed cereals. On um, the left side, left side, again, the classification result based on a chemometric, classical chemometrical approach where you can distinguish between different types within the cereal batch. For example, linseeds, small coconut flakes, uh, and nuts, sunflower seeds, and oatmeal flakes. No. On the other hand, what you can also do in, in this, um, on this example is show uh, define a classification based on the fat content, where you can see, of course, the nuts do have ex exhibited uh, exhibit a high uh, fat content compared to, uh, for example, the cornflakes or the sample, uh, yeah, or the old meal. As last example, I want to show you uh, the, uh, something in the meat processing industry. Uh, this is an uh, image of a chicken breast. And uh, within this chicken breast, you can define uh, different parts of interest. For example, you can define the lean parts of the chicken breast. You can define uh, parts where there's bone and cartilage or a high um, amount of fat. Uh, this is necessary for the meat processing industry, example, uh, for example, uh, for uh, performing uh, uh, processing meat to minced meat. And what you can also do is, uh, is a quantitative analysis approach where you can either plot the water content. This is, uh, has also an important background in, in food fraud. Yeah? And uh, you can also um, evaluate, evaluate uh, the fat content. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I want to end my uh, short presentation with some uh, take home messages for you. One, chemical imaging is versatile in, in the food industry, but there is still room for improvement. A lot of applications um, are thought, but the food industry is very conservative and, and uh, should be more daring to try new things. Yeah. Um, last take home message, uh, carefully select the camera model and according uh, to their camera specifications, according to your application. Um, choose your additional equipment and your analytical approach if you want to do a classic uh, classification development or uh, base your application development on machine learning or AI, AI algorithms. Um, and last but not least, the main applications fields in the food uh, industry range from foreign body detection, 
content and component analysis mixture to advanced quantitative applications of nutrients and moisture. Um, that's it. Thank you for your attention. If you have questions, feel free to ask. Now, go on with our next speaker. And our next speaker is Daniel Plant from the Opsign company. And um, Daniel, you are invited to share your screen with us and provide us with your presentation. So the screen is yours. Thank you. So uh, good morning from Calgary. Um, it's an early morning here. Welcome to everybody. Thank you for being here. So yeah, my name is Daniel Plant. I'm the co-founder of Opsony. Uh, we're a joint venture with a European-based company in the Czech Republic called Photon Systems Instrumentation. Uh, for 25 years, PSI has been developing sensors and systems for measuring everything you would want to know with plants. And uh, we have partnered to take their hyperspectral and some of their other imaging technologies in, out of the research and plant biology domain into other applications. Um, there's a few we're exploring, but today I want to talk to you about some applications uh, in medicine. So this is one of our cameras. I just want to show you some of our technical specifications quickly. Uh, this is a photo a rendering of our veneer camera in the 350 to 900 range. The thing I really want to highlight is our spectral resolution. We're very strong in spectral resolution, signal to noise ratio, and cost, I would say. Um, and these are some of uh, our clients that have you know, installations of our hyperspectral cameras uh, around the world. Again, these are for plants, uh, but the technical specifications I think you'll find are quite strong. The, the big thing in, in medicine and in healthcare uh, lately is this shift toward, toward point of care. Um, and, and this is best exemplified, I think you may know the story of Theranos. You know, they had this machine that could read your blood uh, in the CVS pharmacy. Uh, it didn't take, but the thesis is strong. Uh, we are, we're now mobilizing digital technology, but also sensor technology, you know, think of the Apple Watch, you know, we're starting to get some pretty good diagnostics, um, non-invasively, automatically. This is where medicine is going, you know, hospital costs are ballooning. Uh, so we're looking for more, generally speaking, we're looking for technologies that give us more information on patients on a more continuous basis, on a more automatic basis, and at a much lower cost, closer to the point of care. This is the big, um, I guess, challenge in, in early stage disease detection. You have this gap between onset of the disease and when it would be perceptible either to uh, the, the, the patient or a physician. So this is really where these kinds of screening and early stage diagnostic tools are important. But in a clinical setting, you know, when you, you only see the physician so often, there are high barriers to seeing a physician. It doesn't matter so much, you know, for example, to get uh, one, one mole or one skin lesion checked, you know, it can take, take months. So any technology that could allow you to screen these things on a more regular basis has a lot of promise. This is really what we're looking for. We're looking for sensors that are low cost, high throughput, uh, non-invasive and low cost doesn't necessarily mean the equipment could mean per visit. Um, so this is what we're looking for. Can we give patients more proactive, continuous monitoring of, of their health? Does hyperspectral offer this? Yeah, I mean, we all I think know how hyperspectral works in principle. Um, light is either reflected, absorbed or scattered, which is a particular problem if we're talking about skin and human tissue. 
but we're trying to build a model where we can take these, these sig spectral signatures, convert them into classifications uh, with our classification algorithms and determine uh, pathology. So this requires expertise in optics, uh, medicine, uh, but also specifically in the, 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 uh, the optics of, of human tissue. So a great example uh, for this uh, application, this idea is, is skin cancer. Uh, it's, it's growing in prevalence. These stats are, are for the United States. I, I wasn't able to find some, uh, some that were globally relevant, but the, the story is strong. You know, skin cancer is, has a prevalence of, of 20% for Americans under the age of 70, and they're spending about $8 billion treating skin care in the US alone. But the crucial thing here is that early detection leads to a 99% survival rate. Now, this is generally true of disease, but it is particularly true in this case. So again, technologies that can allow us to see things earlier on before they metastasize, before they become too problematic, uh, are crucial. So what is the latest research on... on hyperspectral skin cancer detection. Well, there's, there's several papers and my sense from reviewing the literature with my colleagues is that you know, the principles are, are fairly well demonstrated. I think there's a strong case that hyperspectral can find uh, early stage cancers uh, better than dermatologists with you know, classical dermoscopic tools and visual inspection. And we're starting to find some chromophores that are useful hemoglobin, melanin concentrations, you know, water, oxygen saturation. These things are showing up uh, quite well with the right instrument. Um, but, but and, and those and you can use those as surrogate markers for uh, for cancerous tissue. So that's promising. But th there's just a few studies. Uh, there's no real you know critical mass around this application. And the, the concept isn't going where, anywhere. There's been a bit of research, but I, I don't see any prospect from my review of the literature that, that this is, has any chance of sort of widespread clinical adoption in, in the next couple of years. And I don't think that's a problem with hyperspectral. So I wanna explain uh, my view on this. So what, what are the roadblocks? Well, I think there's a, there's a few. First, I think is a is a lack of, um, of of there's lots of understanding of optics here, but uh, I I don't think there's due consideration of what is actually clinically relevant. Uh, there's also uh, this pursuit of using hyperspectral as a diagnostic tool straight away. So there are these kind of holy grail ambitions I'm I'm talking about where I, I see researchers. You know, they're trying to use hyperspectral to replace all other diagnostic tools and it's setting too high of a bar initially. There's also uh, image dimensionality issues where the, the research uh, cases that I've reviewed, you know, we are looking at very specific um, cases. And so there's very little data and it doesn't translate well to other patients, to other applications. So ultimately we have this idea that has a lot of promise, but we don't have the data to sufficiently demonstrate the principle so that you know, clinicians could take it forward. So how do we solve this? Well, from my perspective, I, I think we need to start with, not with trying to find cancer and it building a hyperspectral diagnostic tool with a sensitivity and specificity that is unmatched, I think that's setting the bar too high. My view is that we should find higher throughput, um, less, uh, less important, uh, less, less medical, more, uh, more cosmetic applications of hyperspectral where sensitivity and specificity uh, requirements are not so onerous. So this requires, uh, so the first step is to build a data model that can work for these applications. And that means lots of data. So we wanna serve applications where there's very high throughput, a lot of patients coming through, but also a lot of data on an individual patient because comparing 
pixels from one page, patient A to patient B, it can be uh, very challenging because of the dimensionality issues that we mentioned. So uh, having you know, patients come through on, more on a regular basis and comparing pixels of the evolution of their skin within a patient over time um, is, is very important. And, and then over time, as we refine um, the dimensionality issues, improve our data model, you know, maybe as a second stage, we want to identify very clearly uh, which spectral bands are relevant that we can move into a multi-spectral um, and we build a data model in such a way that it can accommodate that and it can also work with say smartphone photos or traditional RGB camera uh, and dermoscopic images. You know, we really want to build a comprehensive data model that can uh, accommodate all of this data. And then I think once that um, you know, commercial basis is set, then I think there's scope to invest in the, the higher value um, diagnostic applications of hyperspectral imaging in medicine. Uh, but without that foundation, I think it's going to be hard for hyperspectral to realize its full potential as a diagnostic tool. So this is, you know, our particular, our vision for how this could work. This is adapted from um, a, a book by Dr. Eric Topol called uh, Deep Medicine. Um, and there's, there's, many, there's many new sensing and, and phenotyping technologies coming online that are enabling this new approach to medicine. I, I believe, and I'm sure many of you agree that hyperspectral is, is one such technology with incredible promise. So this is what we would like to build, um, have our hyperspectral cameras adapted for clinical use, uh, have our, our deep learning and artificial intelligence algorithms in the cloud, uh, processing this patient data, um, delivering results in a, in a, in a visually appealing uh, user interface to the patient and doctor maybe, you, could imagine your experience at the dentist where they show you very clearly, you know, maps of your teeth, you know, that, that is the kind of thing we want to get to. Um, and then a mobile app again, to get some, some more data to correlate with our, our hyperspectral images. And maybe we're using some other sensors as well to see um, the evolution of things in patients. And I'm sure we're going to find is my feeling anyway, that we're going to find a lot more interesting things beyond skin cancer, other diseases, other health issues. They manifest in our skin, and hyperspectral offers the potential to find those those parameters uh, over time. So this is where we we are um, as Opsin. You know, we have expertise in application development, physics, optics, artificial intelligence. Uh, we have partners uh, here in Canada that we have lined up for, uh, I've got them here as high H index dermatologists, uh, highly cited uh, physicians in dermatology. You know, they have a clinic that, uh, that we have, we're looking for uh, capital and some commercial expertise and you know, additional hyperspectral um, medical expertise to join us to kind of take this, this vision to the next step and do our initial proof of concept uh, in clinic. So that's all I have uh, for you today. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel, for sharing your thoughts with us. Um, rooms up for questions. And we will now continue with the program and our next speaker. is Thierry Emeraud from Lambda X. Thierry, it would be a pleasure if you share your screen and provide us with your presentation. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Paul. And uh, thank you for having me here. And uh, especially thanks to Stefan who brought me uh, in the Chi Online uh, community. I'm uh, rather new there, <laughs> but I'm very glad to be there. And it's a very interesting uh, 
platform and um, I would say ecosystem to uh, to for for Lambda X. So I'm Thierry Emerald and I'm from Lambda X, uh, a company in Belgium. And I've um, uh, thank you also to, for the all the audience to be there attending this uh, this this talk. And I have. Uh, uh, given the, the the theme I want to address is high throughput hyperspectral imaging for microscopy and more. And actually, uh, compared to the other speakers, I will push it a little bit more on the technology side, uh, which will make it, uh, I would say, more versatile uh, global uh, in the global content of today. That's, I think, uh, hopefully it's appreciated. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce um, uh, Lambda X, um, who we are and what we do. Uh, we are a SME of 45 people uh, since, and we are active since uh, 25 years ago, and we have three types of activities. We have a product uh, activity. We are offering uh, a range of standard product to perform quality control for the ophthalmic market. We are one of the world leaders here to perform quality control for intraocular lenses and contact lenses. And we have delivered now near to 500 uh, instruments worldwide for this activity. Next to that, we have an engineering uh, um, services activity. And what we do here, we uh, made the custom optical systems that are uh, instrumental for our customers uh, for uh, their product development, either we uh, develop their own their own product, or we uh, contribute with um, optical subsystem, which is a part of their product. And in this uh, engineering activity, we master the whole engineering chain uh, from the optical concept or optical principle down to the certification of the product. Next to that, we have a contract manufacturing activity. In this case, a customer can come to Lambda X. And with its own design, we will uh, take the design from where it stands and we will uh, offer a manufacturing infrastructure and the know-how, including all the necessary toolings to do alignment, uh, assembly, testing, in order to uh, manufacture that product with the uh, required certification uh, level, GMP compliance or, or, or whatever. Um, and uh, our market focus with these three activities is uh, actually um, uh, industrial that uh, contributes to better health. And in this case, we are working in the medical and life science and ophthalmic, as I mentioned, areas. We also uh, contribute with these activities to um, uh, improve uh, uh, processes of our customer. And we have also an activity in the space, which is actu actually the original uh, activity of Lambda X. Uh, we started with an uh, optical system for space, and we are still active in this area. And uh, we have contributed to more than 35 uh, space missions uh, with optics uh, since uh, uh, 25 years ago. Uh, going towards uh, spectros spectroscopy or spectrometry, I'd like to uh, illustrate in this slide shortly uh, our uh, expertise in uh, spectrometry. Uh, so it goes uh, beyond hyperspectral imaging, but um, actually we do uh, spectrometers uh, from uh, the deep UV uh, down to 170 nanometer up to the far infrared up to 14 uh, micrometer. And we have done that for a variety of uh, applications. Most of them, would, I would say, would be around industrial process control for different industries. But we are also uh, uh, doing uh, uh, spectrometers for space. We have, for instance, uh, one spectrometer, which is probing uh, the Mars atmosphere since 2017 and still, uh, still today. And it's in the UV visible. And we do also a spectroscopy system for the biophotonics. And uh, going now to the hyperspectral uh, imaging uh, space. Uh, actually, uh, this slide is just um, uh, give a landscape of uh, how to approach the hyperspectral imaging. Uh, what we all are aiming at is to acquire a 3D cube with uh, a 2D detector. That's basically it. And uh, as you all you know, all of you know, or most of you know, uh, there are different approaches in achieving this. Uh, you can take the push broom uh, dispersive approach. And um, we had LLA uh, today, uh, which has uh, decided to work on this technology. And we have other uh, commercial products available. Or you can take the snapshot uh, approach or the filter-based approach. And there are uh, other 
um, a, a hyperspectral imaging system working with this. You can also take uh, another route, which is the acousto optic uh, filtering. And there are less, uh, I would say, commercial products uh, taking this. It's more laboratory uh, uh, approach. And um, interestingly, uh, Lambda X has uh, um, identified a new path uh, to uh, make hyperspectral imaging, which is to use um, uh, Fourier transfer interferometry. And um, why doing this? Uh, you will see the benefits, actually. Uh, the interesting part is to uh, get to generate high uh, throughput uh, hyperspectral imaging and uh, with uh, uh, very um, high uh, spectral resolution and spatial resolution at the same time. That was our initial uh, statement. We wanted to be uh, to go as far as possible in these two directions. And um, uh, to do that with interferometry, you have to be uh, careful not to take um, uh, any type of uh, hyperspectral imaging or sorry, uh, any type of interferometry uh, in, uh, architecture, you'd better work with uh, what we call a common path interferometer architecture, which will make your device immune to vibrations, which is necessary to have a robust, uh, robust uh, device at the end. And actually what we are doing is we are going to move the optical path uh, over the whole uh, field of view on the, uh, de uh, on the detector. And by doing so, in one acquisition cycle, we will generate or we will generate interferograms at every pixel. And by doing the Fourier transform of this interferogram, we will generate a spectrum for every uh, single pixel. And you see some example here. Uh, we have applied this uh, uh, geometry or this uh, architecture to fluorescent imaging. And uh, recently, we are more and more working on the Raman imaging uh, application, which is I would say one of the application of uh, hyperspectral imaging. So today, um, uh, this uh, original approach uh, we took uh, has uh, resulted into uh, what we call a unique uh, uh, wide field Raman imaging technique. That's the way we want to promote it uh, to the market today. And actually, but you can see it as also a high resolution, a high throughput uh, hyperspectral imaging device. Um, as I mentioned, um, we are, this device is based on the uh, diffraction limit optics. This is why we address today um, uh, microscopy applications. So we want to do hyperspectral images on microscope, uh, uh, microscope for microscopic application, which means we, can, um, we will be able to extract any, um, uh, any hyperspectral information or spectral information or chemical information uh, on this um, with a high uh, spatial resolution. And, um, and uh, basically, uh, you can see the spectral resolution. We can go down to 8 centimeter minus 1 or less around 1 point, uh, sorry, 0 0.13 nanometer at 400 nanometer, which this high spectral resolution, uh, spectral resolution opens the way for us to address uh, Raman applications, Raman imaging applications. And actually, we have indeed uh, compared the resolution of our instrument with uh, a Raman uh, microscope reference Raman microscope of the market and we uh, on here on the molecule which is a paracetamol molecule we have been able to uh, compare and to uh, uh, compare to get the same resolution as a, a reference Raman microscope so today um, if you want to use the device uh, for microscopic application you can you have uh, uh, you have uh, different ways, different approaches. You can uh, actually connect it directly on the port of a standard microscope, which will make it quite convenient, or uh, we can adapt it uh, on a, a given a setup, a customer setup that would like to benefit from his uh, custom microscope setup to get uh, an hyperspectral uh, imaging device or Raman imaging device, or if it is more convenient uh, for the user, we also provide uh, this technique onto a demonstrator platform where you can use it with different objectives, um, uh, automatic um, uh, focus adjustment, and uh, with the different objectives, you will be able to tackle different field of view. Uh, so if we talk to a really um, uh, high resolution microscope, we will work with a 40x uh, 40 uh, magnification uh, objective, but you can also use a 1x objective and then you will be able to image scenes in the range of uh, one square centimeter. So the interest uh, of using this technology with respect to any other technology will be to generate what we call high throughput hyperspectral imaging, not 
uh, too much on the time resolved uh, throughput um, uh, meaning, but more uh, on the on the density of the data you can generate. For instance, we will be able to ge generate a, a three megapixel. A data cube in about 100 seconds, which means a lot of data, which could be uh, quite interesting to extract some uh, information at the cell level if you work with microscopy. And if you compare to Raman imaging, uh, what we propose is an ultra high speed Raman imaging uh, system, which uh, will work uh, uh, with uh, speeds uh, over 1,000 times faster compared to any uh, Raman microscope, which is working on a point-by-point -point acquisition. In terms of applications, um, uh, now uh, um, we are focusing more on the Raman. I illustrate here uh, a few of them. And of course, it is not uh, limited uh, as Raman has, um, has really, uh, is really addressing a lot of different uh, market and applications. But I'd like to illustrate some of the results we have obtained so far. And I would be very happy uh, in the discussion to um, to see who uh, or what type of other application we have not uh, been able to address yet, but uh, which could be interested to use with that technology. Uh, we have um, uh, used this technology for pharma application. Here, what we will uh, do with this uh, with this technology uh, is to control the spatial distribution of uh, active ingredients in a tablet or any type of uh, uh, powder or uh, drug powder. And uh, in this way, we'll be able to uh, monitor the distribution and uh, and to locate uh, the contribution of every uh, species uh, with respect to its uh, uh, chemical or spectrum signature. In the biotech, you can use this technology to make cells and tissue uh, imaging. And in this case, we will use uh, surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy, which is uh, more and more famous or more and more popular for biotech uh, by using some dedicated substrate or dedicated uh, nanoparticle, uh, metal nanoparticle uh, combination with the tissues. We have used this technique in the mechatronics. Uh, you see, there are very different uh, type of application. In the mechatronics, we, are, we have been able to trace on some uh, um, uh, metal components, uh, some chemical residues, uh, meaning that we can tell where they are in the field of view of interest, and we can tell also uh, the type uh, by their Raman signature, the type of um, uh, chemical residue uh, which is present here. Basically, this Raman imaging um, uh, application or technology for Raman imaging is very interesting when you want to monitor some uh, contaminants or impurities on a given uh, material or component where you cannot predict whether it will be there or not and in which, uh, I would say, in which amount and uh, which, um, uh, to which level. And this is uh, exactly what we have here on agri-food. It's uh, melamine detection in powder milk, so it's a kind of uh, agro-food detection. Uh, we found it uh, uh, some people are really interested to monitor this melamine, which is a contaminant which artificially can enhance the protein content of uh, powder milk, but which can uh, really cause some uh, uh, public health concerns. So in this respect, we uh, have uh, demonstrated that we can uh, detect the presence of uh, melamine in, uh, in uh, powder milk using this technique by, as you see uh, here, uh, the chemical um, a signature of that uh, specific components. And the last example I have for today uh, is uh, the monitoring of a nanostructure. You see here some nanostructure which has been uh, processed using some laser uh, processing technology. And um, uh, this is coming from a, a Fraunhofer Institute in Germany. And, um, and uh, they were interested to monitor by this uh, high resolution imaging technique, both the topological um, properties of this uh, material, uh, which are periodic uh, nanostructures, and at the same time to give the local chemical composition of uh, the material which has been processed using this laser technology. So those are not limited, but some of the uh, imaging application we have been able to um, to uh, identify so far, and uh, of course we are looking for more, and we are uh, would be uh, very happy to uh, 
to, um, to, to, to use this uh, forum in order to, to maybe raise the interest for, for some application we have not seen yet. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and we'd be glad to uh, take uh, any question. Okay, half past four, we want to end this. So uh, let me say a big thank you um, to Ms. Karash, to Mr. Plant, and to you, Mr. Amarod, for preparing this very interesting presentations and actually for uh, staying in time and answering all the questions which have come up. Thanks again. And also big thank you to the audience who joined us today. And um, keep in mind that we will go online next month, in the middle of next month, and um, use the functionality the Qi Online community is providing for each of the participant and registered uh, persons. So thank you all for your interest and being with us today and have a great time in the Qi Online community. And hopefully we see each other during some of the next Qi Online web pitch sessions. So enjoy the rest of the day. And hopefully we see each other again. And last but not least to everyone, stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.